going to be today, Acts chapter 3. Before we get into our uh, study, let's go to our God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we're certainly thankful for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We're thankful, Father, that you have left your word uh, for us. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for our study this quarter in the book of Acts. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us as we look into your word, that we will see what you will have us to see and not see what you would not have us to see, Father. We pray, Father, that uh, you'll be with everyone in this class, that much good will come from it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Acts chapter 3, is, we should have a outline uh, just handed out to you. And again, that outline, it's just, uh, that, that's just something for you to take notes on. It's not a lot of, there's not a lot of detail uh, in it, as, as you can see, but just something uh, available for you to uh, take notes on if you so desire. Uh, we kind of finished up in Acts chapter 2 uh, last week. Of course, in the church, we spend a lot of time in Acts chapter 2, and rightfully so, because there's uh, something big that happened in Acts chapter 2, and that was the beginning of the church uh, that we are members of even today. But there's a couple of things I'd like to just kind of uh, uh, nail down uh, at the end of chapter 2 uh, that I think we can benefit from that we didn't quite get to last week. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes there and before we actually get into chapter 3. And uh, so... Uh, let, let's take a look starting in verse 40. And again, uh, if there's something you want to say, let's be as informal as possible. Just speak right up. <clears throat> if there's anything that you'd like to say, uh, please uh, please do so. All right, starting in verse 40, a couple of things I'd like for us to look at here. It says, And with many other words he testified uh, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, in that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, <clears throat> in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, from house to house they ate their food with gladness, and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Just a couple of points I'd like to make here. Um, I think what you see within these last few verses of chapter 2 is a, it, it's kind of a formula for staying faithful, isn't it? A formula for staying faithful. And so, uh, Okay, so they were baptized, but let's look at what these early Christians uh, did. What's, what's one thing that they did in order to stay faithful? Stay together. They stayed together, didn't they? Right, okay. So I think what you see here, uh, in uh, as you go down into verse, uh, say, 46 and 47, is you actually see fellowship among them, right? Uh, kind of, uh, you know, they, they spend time together, uh, even outside of the worship. They spend time together, uh, and uh, that they needed to do that, and we need to do that, right? They spent time together. They, they were forming bonds and friendships and 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 such. But they they were fellowshipping with one another. What else? What else do you see there in that in those few verses that they did? What's that? Praise God. They praised God. Okay. Uh, they were actively in worship together, right? Uh, I believe you see that there. It looks like the context in verses 42 and the, right around there, 42, 43, is that they were in worship together. So a key to staying faithful is we spend time with one another, but we also spend time with one another in what? In worship. Okay. They were continuing steadfast in breaking bread and in prayers. That is a, a reference, uh, probably in that context, to worship. But then later on, it talks about not only in worship, but outside of worship, that they would fellowship together. Yes, sir. I was going to say they were taking care of each other. Ah, taking care of each other. 
so they were a benevolent people, right? Right. Benevolence, uh, uh, helping out one another, not only the spiritual needs right. that they yes. had, but also the physical needs. And there were physical needs. You got to remember, they were coming from all over to Jerusalem, and they were staying longer than they intended to stay, right? <laughs> because of what had happened, and so uh, there there was a definite need uh, within within that group. What else do you see? Where it says uh, they ate with gladness, they were joyful, appreciative of what they had, and okay. happy to be together. Happy to be together. They enjoyed being together. But also, it says, I like what it says here, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It, it, it kind of makes you, it makes it sound like they're very humble people, right? Uh, there's humility involved there, okay? Uh, they, they were joyful because of what they, you know, uh, what, they, what was going on at that time. What else? They were evangelistic. Evangelistic. They were evangelistic. They were, uh, uh, they knew the importance of, uh, of reaching others. Uh, with, with the gospel and in verse 47 who added people to the church God did the Lord added to the church it's not some committee it's not some individual the Lord added to the church uh, and the church was growing quickly because it said they were adding how often daily, daily. Every day. what else they're prayerful they're prayerful they're prayerful Absolutely. We, we, a strong prayer life is extremely important. Absolutely. What else? And fear came upon every soul. Fear came upon every soul. Uh, what was the importance of that? Fear of God. Fear of God. Because we we're told in uh, uh, Proverbs 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Or knowledge. What? Knowledge. Wisdom. The beginning of the Lord is, is the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's something else here, but notice in verse 42, I love the word, they continued how? Steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, okay? They, they were being taught. They were being taught. Uh, they, were, they were eager to learn. So I think that's part of our formula as well as we stay in the Word, right? Uh, we have fellowship with one another. We spend time in, in worship with one another. But we also need to spend time in study with one another, right? And uh, and I think that's critically important uh, as a, for, a formula for staying faithful. And these folks are new Christians. I think that's what we also have to realize. They're new Christians. They've not been at this long. They're starting their journey. They're not finishing their journey, right? So they've still got a lot to learn. Uh, and I think we have to understand that as well. I, I don't know what the percentage is. I haven't seen a study on it. But for those of us that have been in the church for uh, maybe what we might say an extended period of time or a long time, uh, what do we see as far as the percentage of people that we see who put on Christ in baptism? On average, how long do they stay faithful? And what's the percentage of those that do stay faithful? Say for ten years, even. What is that percentage? We don't know, but we see a lot that don't make it, right. They don't stay with it, and that's one thing that we, uh, if if we are uh, Christians that are kind of farther along in, in our uh, in our Christian walk, we've got to be really cognizant and really careful with new converts, those that have just put on Christ in baptism. Because when they do that, and what these folks have done here, what they did, they've essentially declared war on Satan, right? Okay. Uh, and it, it, it's a spiritual battle. As a matter of fact, throughout the New Testament, this battle that goes uh, on between uh, between good and evil, uh, the spirit and the flesh, it says, uh, it, 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 the, the references is to a war, a fight. So. Uh, it's not always pleasant, so we're going to have to, uh, you know, keep that in mind to make sure that uh, we, we stay in contact with new converts because they're really going. Satan is really going to be going after them because they're not mature in the faith yet, right? Yeah. They were welcoming and inclusive. Right. That's right. what we need to be when we have new and because converts. the gospel at this point was available to who? Available at all. Yeah, I was going to sort of extend on that comment. We've had 
you know, a lot of growth here and we're getting ready to move into another right. building and we're going to be faced hopefully with a lot of people that are new to this congregation potentially new to Christ but certainly and we are all guilty of being comfortable with our own social groups yeah yeah and right. it is very difficult to break into a body of this size mm -hmm. and if we don't invite folks into our homes and go out for yeah. dinner with them mm -hmm. we are not being the kind of people that we need to be uh, and uh, Nan and I have moved around quite a bit and we're fortunate in that She's pretty good at integrating our family in, but not everybody can do that. Right. We, I can remember years ago, Nan and I, we're not good at it now, so I don't, but we would have a post-it on our refrigerator door, because we knew, we, we were comfortable with a half a dozen couples, but we put newcomers on there, and we ensured that before we went out with our that we had them into our home or we went out for dinner with them. We need to be more proactive um, and get out our, uh, of our comfort zone. Yeah, right, right. The, the, old, the old comfort zone, it's called comfort zone because it's comfortable, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and we don't always like being uncomfortable. But, uh, but I think this formula here, I, you're right on it. That, that, yep. Those are excellent comments. Uh, so we're we're going to have to really be uh, really be careful that we don't uh, you know some new converts that we don't you might say dip them and drop them okay uh, we, we, we've got to stay with it I just made that up I'm going to give an example just with Nan and, I, and please understand I'm not being critical I'm trying to make the point Nan and I have been here six months no one has invited us into their home including elders yeah. or deacons. Now, does that bother? Not really. We're, we know people and we're better equipped to deal with that, but we have to be sensitive that not everybody right. is good as Nan and I are about forming friendships and we just have to do a better job. Yeah. And we all get busy and we, we all get in a, in a, in a, in a We haven't invited anybody to our home week, yeah. so please understand I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. Yes. I heard an old saying long ago that if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Right. Yes. That's Although right. No excuse. No. I saw a uh, I saw a poem one time about that. You know, about the uh, Satan convict what a poem is an essay or something. But, you know, Satan convened a uh, a, a meeting of his uh, servants, yeah. the, the, the demons, and said. Uh, you know, let's not make it obvious that, you know, we're going to just keep everybody busy. Just yeah. keep everybody busy. And sometimes we, uh, you know, uh, we got to keep those things in mind as busy as we get that uh, there's certain things that, you know, it's about priority. So when we move, we need to be <coughs> yeah. really proactive yeah, so. about integrating people. And not just when we move, but. Because we've got a good mission field here. We right? do. The growth that's happening. Uh, the growth is taking place in Bowling Green. All the new people coming in, and, and that location will be just outstanding uh, and, uh, to, uh, to to help us to uh, reach, reach people. We've got new people coming into the community. Anyway, so. All right. Anything else before we move on to chapter three? They were found. So I find it interesting. So in the NIV that I have in 43, everyone was filled with awe. Yeah. the many wonders and signs yeah it's because they were new everything it was awe it was oh, yeah. really fascinating yeah. it was really cool <clears throat> but once so you've been a christian for a while you kind of we yeah. lose i lose that wonder and that awe of just the day starting again kind of the new wearing off right. you might say yeah yeah that's we come in Getting comfortable yeah comfortable we get our routine comfort Okay, but we're going to find out that these early Christians weren't comfortable for very long. Yeah. Why were they not comfortable for very long? Persecution's getting ready to get, right? Okay, anything else we get into chapter 3? Great comments. Thank you all very much.
Okay, all right, let's go into chapter 3. We see what's happened here. The church has now started. Uh, and uh, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Ninth hour would be, we know, 3 o'clock in Jewish time, right? The ninth hour starts at 6 a.m., so uh, nine, or, yeah, 3 p.m., and a certain, lame, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Okay, so we have a lame man who had not been able to walk for quite a period of time. In fact, he's never been able to walk. Now... What we will find one chapter over in Acts chapter 4 and verse 22, uh, we find out that uh, this man is over 40 years old. In verse 22 of chapter 4 it says, For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Okay? Uh, so uh, Acts chapter 4 says he's 40 years old, he's over 40 years old, and he, he's never walked. So what would that look like? I mean, so so you have the lame, you have this lame man, uh, and they carry him daily to this gate called Beautiful. And as I understand it, this this gate uh, there at the temple was something else. It was uh, you have the outer court where the Gentiles could be, but then you entered into this gate. Uh, it's called the uh, the area of the women, I think it was called. and uh, But this gate, and I did hear something, uh, uh, some speaker had said that it was, uh, this gate was made of Corinthian bronze, and uh, which was, you know, and it was like uh, 60 or 70 feet uh, tall, like 90 feet wide, and I may have those backwards, but anyway, it was a huge thing. Everything at the temple was huge. I mean, it, it was uh, it was just uh, just an amazing scene there at the temple. And so he's there because obviously this would have been a busy spot, right? Uh, as they're going into uh, the prayer time, and uh, he says in verse three, "Who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms." So that's what he did. He uh, he was there begging for money, begging for things. And, uh, and he was there because it was a uh, probably a high traffic area, high traffic area into the temple. And uh, day after day, uh, he had come there, been laid there at this gate for 40 years, over 40 years. So this is, and sometimes we'll read these miracles and kind of just kind of uh, graze past them a little bit and take a little something. But think about that. Okay, he's over 40 years old, and he's never walked. What would his legs look like? Yeah, I mean, it would have basically been maybe bone with skin, right? There would have been no muscle. Um, it, it, it would have just, just you know, what, what's the medical term? Is it atrophy? I mean, if you don't use it, you muscle mass, you lose it. So, uh, I mean, that, that's what you're dealing with here, over 40 years. And so he sees Peter and John about to go into the temple. He asks them for money. And fixing his eyes on him, with John, Peter said, look at us. Look at us. I thought that was interesting. Of course, you know, we, we talk about the fact that he's probably sitting at a place of, uh, you know, high traffic area. And, uh, and we're seeing this more in our current culture, right? Uh, pretty much anymore at any busy intersection, you're going to see someone holding up a sign or asking for this or that or, or whatever. But what do we do a lot of times if we're if we encounter that situation? Look away. We look away. Mm -hmm. We avoid eye contact, don't we? Well Peter invites eye contact here. He says, so he gave them he says, look at us. So he gave them his attention. Why? Because he was expecting to receive something from them. What was he expecting to receive? Money. He was expecting to receive money, right? <coughs> then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Okay? We know that in the name of means what? By the power of or by the authority of, right? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, keep in mind, the people there, see something is happening here at the beginning of chapter 3 that's very similar to what we see at the beginning of chapter 2. In other words, there's something going on. There's a miracle happening in order to do what? Draw a crowd. Draw a crowd. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, uh, there was a they drew a crowd by what? The sound of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, you've got these guys who are who don't know certain languages or speaking these languages fluently, and so you know it, that that creates a that, that creates a multitude. Create it draws a crowd. Well, this is getting ready to draw a crowd because all these people that go in and out of that gate every day, they're going to recognize him, right? They're going to recognize him. It's just like if you're driving through Bowling Green, a lot of times you'll see the same person at the same intersection, right? You're, you're, they're going to recognize this guy. Uh, and he says, uh, <laughs> now you talk about some faith. So you basically have a guy who, who at this, by, within 40 years, he's not going to really have any legs at all. So he, what's amazing here is he lifts him up. Now that takes some faith there, right? <laughs> that Christ is going to do what he says he's going to, okay, by the power of Jesus Christ, I'm putting my faith, because could you imagine, you know, he, I want, in the back of his mind, did he have any doubt whatsoever? Apparently not, because he just lifts him up, uh, grabs him by the hand and lifts him up. And he says uh, his ankle bones receive strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, Look what he was doing. Not only was he now walking, he was leaping and praising God. Now, there's nothing to indicate that this individual had any faith before this miracle happened. You know, we're not really told, but we know that Peter had faith enough that he would he would uh, lift him up. Uh, it says. Verse 10, then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Well, look at look at the parallel. Acts 3 is very much a parallel to Acts chapter 2. Uh, look at verse 7 of uh, Acts chapter 2. Look at that reaction. Uh, then they were all amazed and marveled. Okay, so here we see that they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So this guy, this newly healed individual, is really creating a scene. Really creating a scene. Not only is he walking around, he's leaping, he's uh, praising God. And they, you know, this is the guy that for 40 years people have been walking by and they recognize him and they're filled with wonder and amazement. And so that is going to draw a crowd. Verse 11. Now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Greatly Amazed. Now, this porch of Solomon's, it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's on the east side of the temple. Uh, it was uh, not like any, it's not like a regular porch. Uh, I've, I've seen something that said it was anywhere between 1,000 and 1,500 feet long. It was this huge, uh, huge area. And uh, it, it says uh, they, they assembled there. Uh, greatly amazed. I want you to see what Peter says. So when Peter saw it, verse 12, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness 
we had made this man walk. So who is Peter getting ready to give glory and credit to? God, right? Uh, what's interesting about that, you remember back, you, you see the progression of Peter. And uh, you know, we kind of give Peter a hard way to go, don't we? <laughs> Uh, a lot of times when uh, you know uh, you see I, I've seen statistics about uh, news coverage about so and so they'll receive X percent of positive coverage and X percent of negative coverage and, and, and press coverage and all that we probably give Peter a hard way to go a lot of times our, our, our coverage of Peter we're studying him uh, sometimes we focus on the negative but look at the change in Peter. Because you remember what was going on and the apostles as a whole. Remember what was going on in Mark chapter 9? In Mark chapter 9, Jesus says, what were you all arguing about on the road? What were they arguing about? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to be the greatest in this kingdom? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be so at, at one point, the apostles were... Was, Hey, it's about me, right? It's about me. But by this point, Peter is uh, making sure, and he's very careful, that he gives glory to God. He says, uh, "Why are you? Don't think that I did this. Don't, don't, don't think that I did this on my power. As a matter of fact, uh, on your sheet, uh, verses one, then the first section says Peter performs a miracle on a lame man. You should probably mark out Peter." Put God, right? right? God performed that miracle. He said, but Peter was used as an agent to accomplish that, right? Just like God uses us as agents to accomplish His will today, right? So He says, uh, so He says, don't don't look at me thinking that I did this. Verse thirteen says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are all names that these Jews recognize, right? Uh, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. Okay, now here he begins his sermon. Okay, the crowd is now assembled on Solomon's, let's call it a portico, okay? It's more than a porch. The, the crowd is assembled, and now he goes into his second sermon. We looked at his first sermon back in Acts chapter 2. Here's his second. He says... Uh, and he brings up Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Pilate was even willing to let him go, but you know, you you're you denied him, but you denied in verse 14 the Holy One and the just. What's that mean? I mean he's sinless, right? There's no sin. No sin. And ask instead, and, and so you, you crucified him, the sinless one, for a and ask for a murderer to be granted to you, Barabbas, right? And killed. Here's what you did: you denied him, and then you killed him, the prince of life, the prince of life. Um. If you've got the English Standard Version of Scripture, I think there's a different word there. Author. What's it? What is Author. It? Author of life. Okay. In that particular situation, that's probably a better translation. Author of life. Uh, who gives life? God. God. And Christ is right there with him, right? John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were created by Him. Um, so He is the author of life whom God... Okay, now here's the critical part. Whom, and this is the part that's going to make a lot of them mad. Uh, that's going to lead to something initially not so pleasant for them. At the beginning of chapter 4, uh, he's, he's saying again, whom God, remember who He's giving credit to, God did what? Raised from the dead. And as proof of that, I'm telling you, he says, we are, of which we are witnesses. We talked about in our judicial system uh, that one of the uh, 
And one of the uh, uh, most uh, uh, compelling pieces of evidence is uh, eyewitness testimony of a credible source, right? And uh, of course, now you also have DNA and all that, but uh, as we've advanced scientifically, but but there, there's really no substitute for an eyewit a credible eyewitness, right? And he says that's what we are. That's what we are, Peter, John. That, that's what we are, the apostles. We are eyewitnesses to this. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, whose faith is he talking about? Probably talking about Peter and John's faith. Uh most likely Peter and John's faith here that Peter had the faith to pull him up knowing that if he did he would walk yet now brethren I know here he is in the midst of this sermon yet now brethren I know that you did it in ignorance as did also your rulers but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Okay, so he says, okay, you were ignorant. You didn't know what you were doing. But is that is that a legitimate excuse? Apparently not, because he turns right around and tells him to repent. Okay? Okay. So he says, this has been fulfilled by the mouth of all the prophets that the Christ would suffer. He has thus fulfilled. You want to just take a, maybe mark your place there and go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We'll read just a few verses of Isaiah 53 because what it talks about this, the prophecy of the suffering Christ, the prophecy of the suffering Savior, Isaiah 53 just nails that. Uh, let's read just maybe the first uh, six verses or so. It says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. Notice the suffering. Notice, notice what happens with Christ and the suffering he endures. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. And, you know, if, as you're reading this, where it says our, you know, we could actually put a personal pronoun in there, right? Me, okay? He was wounded for my transgressions, okay? Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And look at how he finishes this particular verse. Uh, you know, we, we wonder sometimes why the crucifixion of Jesus was so terrible. It was the it's the worst form of execution known to man. Just brutal uh, in, in so many ways. Well. It, it was an ugly scene, right? Well, here's why. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because sin is a terrible thing, right? Sin uh, is what took him there. And so our sin, not his. So anyway, I just thought that those few verses there give you a good glimpse of what he's talking about here uh, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 18. Okay. Verse 9. Anything up to this point? I was just going to say, um, 
Chuck Bringer, I don't know if he's in here, but he reads when he does the Lord's Supper, mm -hmm. the, when he speaks at the Lord's Supper, that he always always says he yeah. speaks verse five and six. Oh like yeah. There. Oh yeah. Well, it's it's a it, it's a great passage. It's a reminder for us what Jesus went through. Yes. It's interesting. Does everybody agree with David on that? I have a, I have a verse. 
verse, um, a parallel verse to that uh, in Matthew 17, 11, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. Yeah, there, there's some. There, there, that's, a, that's the other. There's basically three ways of... Uh, there, there's three different avenues of thought on that. Was that the first bell? Okay. There's three avenues of thought on, on what this times of refreshing is that I've seen. One is what David so eloquently uh, uh, described there, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's also some that says, well, he's talking about the blessings of salvation. That, uh, you know, we have certain blessings knowing that we are saved. Uh, and then there are some that say that it is uh, tied to the second coming of Christ. Uh, that is tied to the second coming of Christ. And uh, I think all of these probably have some merit. And I'm not sure they're, I, I think a lot of times, I think they might be actually saying the same thing. That uh, there, there's all these blessings that comes from knowing we're saved. Uh, we know what's waiting for us when Christ comes back. What is waiting for us when Christ comes back? Well, you know, these physical bodies are deteriorating and uh, we're going to die and our spirit is going to go and be with Christ but our body is going to be uh, uh, buried or, or whatever uh, what we do there and uh, it's going to decay but we're going to have a new body according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, it goes through a series of comparisons there uh, about our current, our current body and what our new body is going to be like and then we'll be called up to meet uh, Christ in the air. Yes? That word times makes me also wonder if he's talking about fulfilled prophecy because he goes on to talk about the prophets. Yes. He always referred to those last days. Yeah. You know, think of Daniel 2, 44, and the kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if that could be a sort of a tie-in also. A absolutely. The, 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 the prophecies being fulfilled. Uh, over this period of time. And that also goes on in verse 21 because we're going to be looking at something else there at times of restoration. And there's some that think that, that that's, that's tying in with the fulfillment of all those prophecies. That's a good comment. Yes. You know, it makes you think of uh, uh, new baby. Yeah. They yeah. bring them out for the first time. Yeah. They're fresh. Yeah. And Born again, yeah. you're refreshed. That's right. You're refreshed. You're, you've done it again. You're that, fresh. Exactly. 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 Uh, there was a passage of scripture that I may have lost in here, and I did not write it down like I had intended to. Uh, I think it was in John. Anyway, what we, we equate a lot of times refreshment to what? Water, right? Water. And, uh, uh, Nick Danes, you think about it? What's that? Nick Danes, you think yeah, about it? Yeah, I, I don't know. There was, a, there was a passage in here that kind of equated the Holy Spirit and water that I, that I just missed. But, but, uh, but yeah, there, there's several different, uh, several different thoughts on that. Uh, you know, after looking at the, the different arguments about what he's talking about there, I was uh, I was kind of reminded uh, of uh, you know there was a guy that uh, there were three guys they were all friends and two of the friends got into an argument they had a disagreement about something so uh, they uh, they went they brought this to the third friend and, and said uh, we're having this argument uh, what do you think about it he says I stand firmly on both sides so uh, it's kind of oh. all right we'll go on anything else on that. Yeah, I think those are all, all good comments there. Verse 20, And that he may send Jesus Christ, whom was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Okay? Alright, there's we've had times of refreshing. What's times of restoration? What's that? The second coming. The 
Sec okay, second coming. What's going to happen during the second coming? What does First Peter three? I think it's or Second Peter. I'm sorry, Second Peter three verse thirteen say. New heaven and new earth where righteousness dwells. Right? There's not going to be any sin there. All the effects. Our new dwelling place. And when Christ comes back, it's going to be without sin, only righteousness. Uh, things are going to be restored. And if you look in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 22, even the creation itself was cursed, and it says it longs for that uh, for that restoration. Restoration is to uh, you know restore something to a previous state. All right. So uh, anyway, take a look at that between now and next uh, uh, next week, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that first. Right. I believe I heard the second bell. Thank you all.